volunteered their time. These are people who have spent years uh, working toward what some of you are just getting started on. <clears throat> they are well-versed in the world of open educational resources and they have done some pretty incredible work. And I'm gonna, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Quinetta Bartley to uh, please introduce them here in just a few minutes for you. So um, let me let me move this to the presentation mode so that you can get a better glimpse of it. Okay. So this is number three of five in a series, and uh, we, we're calling it the Summer Series Workshop. And basically the, the intention behind this collection of workshops is to help campuses, uh, campus coordinators, um, OER fellows, to be able to um, unfold and implement the affordable learning solutions packages within their campuses in a way that is sustainable, in a way that makes sense for people, in a way that's inclusive and um, allows, allows us to really scale and grow this initiative that has been funded under the Hewlett Foundation. Um, oops, sorry. It's been in this project has been ongoing, and this is, I believe, the third year. <clears throat> with uh, with I I'm going to say it's the fourth in a series of funding from the Hewlett Foundation. It may even be the fifth. Um, at any rate, uh, we have a a pretty strong uh, collection of partners in this particular project, with Tennessee State University being the lead. Um, California State University, Merlot and Skills Commons. Um, that's who I work under. And my name is Maria Feith and I work under Jerry Hanley. I'm here with Rick Lumadu, and we are your support system along with what is called open culture. And you're going to get a chance to um, spend some time with Angela in, in two weeks. Angela and her team are working on what is called playbooks. And playbooks are... Um, are going to be, uh, they're gonna take a strong look at data and they're going to provide some insight and create guides for how to proceed so that the work that you're doing is impactful, effective, time efficient, and you know exactly what it is that's working and what it is you can leave aside so that we're not wasting time. Nobody has time to do that. We know that you're very, very busy and you have lots going on. This is just one of the many, many things that are that's on your plate, and so um, we want you to we want you to know that we think about that a lot. We also are um, coordinating with MIT Open Courseware. MIT has done a beautiful job of collecting and cataloging um, open educational resources, and um, those folks have uh, they've been a good role model for us, and they've been a good partnership for this project as well. Um, this, this five workshop series is part of the planning, um, for this, for the entire project. And the planning is probably the most important piece. The, without the planning, sustainability does not happen. And if you don't have sustainability, then you're wasting your time all the way up to the point where you're going, well, is this going to stick? So we take this part super seriously and we make sure that you have the resources that you need in order to implement and then fully sustain. We have um, a number of things that we've gone over in previous um, webinars and workshops, and we're happy to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. If after this conversation, you're feeling like I could use a little more information, I could use some one-on-one, -on -one, or, or there's about four of us on my campus that really could use some time with you, please reach out. Our, um, e we'll put the emails into the chat and make sure that you have direct access to either myself, Maria Fee, or Quinetta Bartley, or Rick Lumadu. Um, any of the three of us can help you. Um, we also have a, an HBCU ALS Resource Center, and I'm going to put that in the chat here momentarily. And you'll find a recording from last week's or two weeks ago, the um, two of five workshop there. You'll also find slide decks from each of the 
three workshops that have been launched already. And by the time we're done with the summer, all five will be posted there. There are also lots and lots of other tools for implementing the Affordable Learning Solutions um, project on your campus. And um, they're, they're all available for you to download and take and use as is most helpful for you. And again, if you have questions, that's why we're here. And we are very, very happy um, to, to take your questions at any point. Uh, today's agenda is we're going to be talking about developing and sustaining the open mindset um, campus wide. And it, what we find is that on most campuses, there are a few people who really kind of uh, jump on right away. And we call those the champions. They they have uh, taken it on a lot of it on their own, learned a lot about it, and they're in the forefront. And you can find that around almost any initiative. And um, that's kind of how human nature works. Somebody gets in, involved in it, excited about it, sees the sees the benefits, and then other people start paying attention. That's a little bit how this is this is working too across campuses uh, nationwide. It, today's discussion will be talking about engaging stakeholders. It will be about policy development and refining change management. Um, if you had a chance to be in Denver at the OLC. Um, innovate. Jerry Hanley talked quite a bit about change management and the components that are really necessary in order to make change management occur and um, and stick. And so uh, there's some very specific kinds of things that that need to happen. And I think uh, when you hear Jean Jacques discussion today, you're going to see some of that come out as well. Okay. So if you have not registered on Merlot, it will benefit you to do that. It's free registration. You go to www.merlot, M-E-R-L-O-T, merlot.org. And in the upper right corner, you'll see, uh, you'll see the words register. And if you are already a member, that's where you would log in as well. So it's difficult to access all of the benefits. It's not possible to access all of the benefits unless you are a member. So please, please register. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Quinetta Bartley, who is going to um, facilitate our guest speakers today. So Quinetta, it's all about you. Good afternoon, everyone. And first, let me say thank you for attending our um, session today. You're about to get some good information. Uh, these two people that are gonna come before us today has a wealth of knowledge about OER, and I love hearing their testimonies personally, so I know that you will. So we're gonna start with Dr. John Jacques Modestin. Uh, Dr. Modestin received his bachelor's in biology from King State University. He then obtained his master's degree in information technology from America Intercontinental University. And finally, Dr. Modestin earned his doctorate in educational technology from Walden University. Before becoming the executive director of the Global College at Albany State University in Albany, Georgia, Dr. Modestin served as the Dean of Distance Education and Learning Support Services at Edward Waters University for three years. He also spent seven years as the director of online learning at Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, after 10 years as an assistant professor in information technology at Clayton State University in Morrow, Georgia. Additionally, from 20, oh, 2006 to 2012, he was the lead developer for a consortium of five universities in Georgia offering an online bachelor's of information technology. With over 30 years of combined experience in higher education, and the corporate world, Dr. Modestin is an experienced IT professional and educator. Coming from the modest background, coming from a modest background and having grown up in a low income family, which sparked his passion for increasing access to education through open, free or low costing resources, Dr. Modestin advocates tirelessly for more affordable learning options. So now I present to you Dr. Jean Jacques. Dr. Jacques, you're on mute. We cannot hear you. 
You're on mute. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. I feel like a Verizon uh, person. But uh, thank you for the introduction. And thank you all for being here. And I'm happy to see you. I see Ravi. Thank you so much. Uh, I am happy to be here. You all know how excited I am about uh, uh, OER. And it is my privilege today to share with, with all of you my experience and what I think uh, you all uh, can do as you is if you get to be as passionate as I am about OER. Uh, next, please. So the, the questions that I was presented with, uh, the first one being, what are the first and most important starting ste uh, steps to implement OER on, on campus? And first, I, I wanna uh, uh, give a, a shout out to my team, my teammates at ASU. I see a number of them here. I wanna acknowledge them uh, 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 joining the call today. Thank you for, for being here. Um, so I, I, you know, I could only come up with uh, seven steps um, that are the most uh, important in my views, uh, and it could be more or fewer for somebody else. Uh, the first, I think, is awareness and advocacy. Uh, if you want to implement OER on campus, you, the first step is to raise awareness about OER among institutional stakeholders. Uh, including administrators, and, and more importantly, you know, uh, uh, administrators, faculty, and students. Uh, it, it involves educating them on the benefits of OER, and it, OER is not second nature for most people. You don't go on campus and see everybody talking about OER. So you need to you need a champion, somebody who knows the value of OER, to to show the benefits of, of it to people, such as cost saving for students, flexibility in course design, and the ability to adapt and customize content to meet specific learning needs. Secondly, this one is, is difficult, but it's important. Developing clear institutional policies and guidelines around the use, creation, and sharing of OER is crucial. You don't want any, everybody to be all over campus, and it happens in some institutions where everybody's doing something about OER or on OER, OER, but no actual uh, policy about uh, uh, the use of it. So having a, a policy ensures a consistent and supporting uh, supportive framework uh, for faculty and staff to adopt and contribute to OER initiatives. Of course, third, faculty and staff engagement. Engaging faculty and staff in all your implementation process is, is, is vital because it's, they are the ones who are going to carry out the uh, initiative. It includes providing professional development opportunities. And, and, and that is also, this is very dear to, to, to my heart because uh, I understand that faculty are busy. Uh, teaching and, and so on. And even if you show them the value of where you are, you are also have to appreciate their time. Uh, so providing events, uh, incentive, uh, such as I, I remember my position at, at Central State was funded by a Title III. What I had to do is to write in the grant uh, some incentive for uh, adoption of an OER uh, textbook. And also sometimes in doing my workshop, I, and thank to, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Robbie Melton and Dr. Uh, Henley, uh, we had a small grant where we could uh, provide uh, some kind of uh, gift card for each uh, workshop they attended. So even though this is not paying them for what they're doing, but it shows some appreciation. And they, they even, you know, they appreciate the fact that we acknowledge that they don't have time and, to be engaging in, in this in this type of uh, uh, initiative is 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 uh, is important uh, uh, to to the institution and to them. So next, please. And number four, the content creation and and curation, identifying, and this is where I'm going to talk about Merlot. Merlot has done uh, such a wonderful uh, job, uh, and uh, Dr. Enley and her team with Maria, they've done such a wonderful job uh, providing 
uh, a, a vast, uh, you know, repertoire of, of OER materials. So they help us with identifying, evaluating, and curating high quality OER content that aligns with, with course learning uh, objectives. And, and that's a very important step. Additionally, uh, supporting faculty and staff in the creation of OER uh, uh, can further expand available resources. And that's why we're gonna talk about technical infrastructure, which is uh, step five ensuring the, the, the necessary the necessary technical infrastructure such as a content management system or a repository uh, where they can host and manage and distribute all your content effectively is important uh, because uh, that way you show them you you really care about having all your on campus and like I said it's not second nature so you have to have all your 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 dots uh, and T's cross. So, and also collaborative partnership, which is something that, uh, again, Merlot uh, and his, uh, uh, Dr. Henley and his team and Dr. Uh, uh, Robbie Melton and, and, and her team, they are, they are doing with the grant that they have received from uh, uh, Uta Packard to allow us to have hubs and affiliates that we collaborate with affiliate institutions, and also content providers such as uh, MIT OpenCourseWare. And we, uh, so we go back to Merlot, we go back to Skills Commons and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and other organizations that can help leverage resources, share best practices and create a robust OER uh, ecosystem. Again, number seven, in the first steps, we gotta have funding. Uh, to have a sustainable uh, I'm in a thing I, I finish here I, I present so I can't um <laughs> we have some in interference all right so I, I think we're okay Jean Jacques sorry about okay that. great so number seven we have to have funding and again I I think the teams again are working on getting that funding to help us continue this, this great work. Uh, sometimes uh, you may have institutional support, but if you don't, uh, grants, uh, outside grants, can external grants can help, but you have to have some kind of revenue, some kind of funding to, to help in the long-term success and scalability of OER initiatives. Next, please. So those are the seven steps uh, that I think are the most important. Now, and you guys can stop me in the middle if you have questions, if you have something to add. Uh, the second question was, how do we ensure open and accurate communication? Well, the first thing I would say is to establish communication channels. Uh, creating dedicated communication channel uh, channels, such as email, distribution list, uh, uh, forums, online forums, collaboration platforms. For example, some of us use uh, Microsoft Teams or SharePoint, uh, any platform that you have on your campus that you can uh, uh, use as a collaboration platform uh, would be important to uh, keep the uh, communication going. Uh, encouraged also two-way communication because you see, you're gonna want to hear from your stakeholders. Uh, their voice, their concerns, their questions, their suggestions, you want to hear from, the, from, from them. So uh, have a two-way communication some, somehow. Uh, also, and that's why you need champions on campus, because you, you need to appoint dedicated OER communication leads uh, or, or student committee uh, responsible for coordinating and dis disseminating information. So those people, they have to be passionate about uh, about OER or, or, or at least know the value of OER so that they can serve as the uh, uh, primary point, points of contact and be responsible for keeping all stakeholders informed. And again, uh, you have to develop a comprehensive communication plan that outlines the target audience. The messaging is very important and it has to be consistent and you have to determine how frequent uh, you're going to uh, send uh, 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 those message, those messages, messages, 
and and what what methods of communication that you use it may be different in different campuses but at least you have to be consistent in the way you do it so the plan should address the needs of various stakeholders including faculty staff students and they all are your stakeholders and any external partners such as our uh, uh, hub affiliates next please next slide so leverage multiple communication format because uh, you know you, you have to utilize a variety of communication formats such, such such as email updates newsletters whatever works on your campus workshops and we're going to talk about workshops and face-to-face -face meetings uh, to reach different stakeholders and groups uh, uh, you have to tailor the communication style and content to the needs of the and preferences of each audience. Audiences are different. Uh, encourage uh, uh, feedback and, and dialogue. Because like I said, this is not second nature. This is a major under, undertaking. Uh, solicit, actively solicit feedback from stakeholders through surveys, uh, focus groups, or open forums. And respond to one thing that I think is important, not just with OER, but with anything, uh, people have to be responsive. And so with OER, respond to inquiries and address concerns in a timely manner uh, so that you can maintain trust and, and transparency. Because like I said, uh, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take uh, all of these to make, to ensure that you're successful in your endeavor. Maintain, ensure that all communication materials, including presentations, documents, and online content, uh, convey a consistent message and align with the institution's OER goals and objectives. And that's why uh, you have to, to think ahead and think about a, a campus-wide implementation, step-by-step, -step, but think uh, uh, ahead. Provide training or uh, resources to help stakeholders communicate effectively about OER initiatives. And so, and if you know of, of existing communication channels on campus uh, on your, in your institution, uh, such as faculty senate meetings or staff new newsletters or student information portals, whatever uh, you know that, that is available on campus to use that to help dis dis disseminate OER related updates. So that's how we can make sure that the uh, it is ingrained in the uh, institutional communications channel uh, ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. So third question was, how, how do you assess the readiness levels at your institution? That one, again, is going to take a little work. Uh, first, I would, I would say to, to conduct surveys and interviews with key stakeholders and, and finding out who those people are. Uh, you do it with faculty, staff, and students uh, to gauge their awareness and their attitude and their level of engagement with OER. Gather information about their usage of, of OER, any barriers or challenges that they face and, and what the type of support that they perceive that they need. Uh, you may have to do an environmental scan of the institution, perform uh, a scan to understand uh, the institution existing infrastructure policies, if there are any, and resources related to OER that they may have. You may have to talk to the librarian and take to, talk to different uh, uh, colleges, uh, uh, find out who, who's doing what uh, regarding OER on campus. Assess the availability, availability of technical platforms, content repositories, faculty development programs. They may have, they may, there may be some on campus that you know, don't know about. Find out so that you don't have any parallel uh, uh, programs going on. Um, and develop or adapt a readiness assessment framework that covers various dimensions of OER implementation, such as uh, leadership support. That's important, faculty engagement, content availability, and technical capacity. Um, and use this framework to evaluate the institution's current state and identify areas that will require more attention or support. Uh, next, please. Uh, and you can use what we call a, a, a maturity model approach to assess the institution level 
of OER adoption and implementation. This can have identified the current stage of institution. Uh, you know, you find out about awareness on campus, exploration, adoption, or, or whatever uh, is available in campus, and that would in, in inform the necessary uh, uh, next steps in your in your implementation plan. You may have to conduct a, a, a gap analysis to identify the discrepancies between the desired state of OER, what you have in your plan, and and, and the current state, how, how far they've gone, if they've done anything on campus already. So this analysis can help prioritize the areas that need the most support, such as professional development, content curation, or technical infrastructure. Uh, pilot programs, you know, like I said, this is a major undertaking. You may not want to uh, impose all your on the entire campus and, and, and expect great results. You may need to implement pilot OER initiatives in specific departments uh, or courses uh, to gather real world feedback and insights. Use the lessons learned from the, 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 the pilot initiatives to refine the support and resources that you would need to for a broader implementation, uh, campus wide implementation. And engage with other institutions that have successfully implemented OER to learn from their experiences. That's why. The affiliate programs is, is good uh, because it allows the hub to share with uh, the affiliates their success uh, stories and for the affiliates to reach out to the, to the hub to, to, to learn from them. So the support mechanism that, that, that they have in place, benchmark the institution's progress against their peer institutions to identify areas for improvement. Next, please. Now, the last question was, okay, how do you provide support for faculty and staff for an ALS effort? So ALS is the initiative uh, with Merlo and, and Tennessee State with, uh, with uh, Dr. Robbie's team. Um, first, we go back to provide comprehensive awareness and education campaigns to inform faculty and staff about benefits of OER and the uh, HBCU ALS initiative. And I have to say that I, I am very, very grateful to, to uh, Robbie uh, and her team and Dr. Henley and, and, and his team, because you see, you may not know this, but some people do know it. Uh, I have a personal uh, experience with uh, OER that, that, that you know, I'd like to share with you. You know, growing up in, 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 in Haiti, uh, in high school, I remember not having the means to pay for textbooks. And we're not talking about $350 textbooks uh, that we see today. We're talking about maybe $5 textbooks that I could not afford. And then and, and I had to borrow books from my peers and hand copy chapters to study for exams. So. So I, when, when I heard about OER a few years ago, I, I attended a, 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 uh, an HBCU summit uh, at an OLC conference when I met Robbie and, 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 and Dr. Uh, uh, Henley. They did not know me, I did not know them, but I was so excited about the opportunity to to take this back to my campus, to this, this opportunity offered to, to give us a, a free portal for OER that has that is connected, integrated with the whole Merlot library, I thought that was gold. Because let me tell you what happened a few years ago. I'm about to finish the, but a few years ago, when I was at, at Central State, there was a, a student. I, I, when I was uh, the uh, director of, of distance learning, I had uh, the opportunity to teach one course and it was college algebra. And I had a student who was about to drop out of the class because the book was expensive. You could not afford it and he was, it was failing. And so he came to my office and, uh, and he was uh, telling me that he had to drop because uh, it was too expensive. I did not know about OER then. So what I did, I, I gave him my copy of the book. He stayed in the class and 
he succeeded. He got to be in the class. And I, I can tell you that student has adopted himself in, into my family two years in a row. He flew from uh, Detroit, Michigan to Jacksonville, Florida for my birthday. And he calls himself Dr. JJ Jr. And to my surprise, my, 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 my daughter was having a birthday party for her husband in Ohio, and she sent me pictures, and I saw him in the pictures. So he is part of the family. You never know what impact you can make for one student just for helping them achieve their goal of, uh, of, uh, of obtaining a college ed education. Even a, a textbook can make a, a whole difference in their life. So, so we have to inform faculty about the benefits of OER to every student uh, on campus, those who cannot afford to buy a textbook. And, and also about the HBCU ALS initiative, which is a great opportunity for them to, 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 to do it right. Organize interactive workshops, and I, I, I've done that a lot, and we're gonna do some of that at uh, uh, Albany State University. Webinars and information sessions to so engage faculty and staff and address their concerns or questions. Faculty development and training offer sustained professional development opportunities for faculty to learn about finding, uh, evaluating. Again, that, that's where uh, Merlot is, is, a uh, is a great source uh, for them because you, you learn from other people here, or you've learned already, that we have a cultural you know, selection. Merlot has done a phenomenal job in, in curating content uh, for HBCU particularly. So it, it's, you know, finding that opportunity to, to, or teaching them about finding and evaluating, adapting and, and, and integrating OER into their courses. Provide training on topics such as copyright, which is extremely important because they may not know uh, uh, about creative common licenses. What do they do if they want to use a, a piece of OER material that has some restrictions on it? What type of restrictions? What can they do with that material? And if they create, create their own, how do they publish it? What restrictions should they put? So what type of permission should they uh, uh, give people who use their materials? So those are important and we need to train faculty on those. And, I, and when I conduct training on Creative Commons licenses, people are very excited to attend because there are things that they did not know about copyright, et cetera. So, and finally, instructional design support. Assign instructional designers or educational technology specialists to work closely with faculty and with designing courses using OER, assist faculty in aligning OER content with course learning objectives and, and ensuring pedagogical uh, effectiveness. Those are the things that we need to do. I think I, there's one more slide and I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, get out of your air. Yeah? So yeah, there's one more slide. <laughs> so uh, we, we've talked about this uh, before, content creation, uh, uh, curation and, and repositories. Uh, ensure that you develop a curated, a centralized repository of high quality, and and think again, thank goodness for for Merlot, uh, vetted OER content that is relevant to the HBCU curricula. Uh, provide easy to use search and discovery, and and uh, Jerry Enley is always showing people how easy it is to uh, research uh, Merlot for any type of materials that, that you have. And, and also there was a demonstration on, on skills commons uh, on how to search for relevant materials. Um, peer mentoring and, and learning communities, that's what we are, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, established faculty learning communities or peer mentoring programs to facilitate the exchange of best practices, lessons learned, which is exactly what we're doing in collaborative problem solving. Encourage faculty to share their experiences and provide peer-to-peer -peer support in adopting and using OER. Incentive again, uh, we have to, I mean, talk to the big, uh, uh, the uh, administrators, the uh, VPs, the presidents, 
uh, to provide us with the funding that we need to offer incentives such as course release time, uh, professional development funding, or recognition in, in the tenure and, and promotion process to encourage faculty participation uh, and contributions to the HBCU ALS effort. It may be that they find this is a great thing they're doing helping students, but they need to know also that we appreciate their effort in doing so. Acknowledge and celebrate faculty champions uh, who have successfully implemented OER in their courses. And finally, uh, ensure that they have the technical, technical support that they need, uh, uh, IT and, and, and repository, learning management system, whatever they need to, to, to uh, do their job, offer administrative support for, for tasks like a copyright clearance, we talked about that, metadata, tagging, and, and, and publishing over your content, whatever it is that we need to do to help them uh, uh, get their job uh, done and, and help our students succeed in obtaining education. Uh, don't let the, the, the textbook course uh, uh, stand in their way of an education. I think that's it for me. Thank you for listening, and I take any questions at this time. Dr. Jean-Jacques, I don't have a question, but I do like to comment on you saying we do make a, a significant impact on the students when we introduce open educational resources, because there are a lot of students that would like to carry on with their degrees and just cannot afford the materials. So that's a big impact that we continue to enforce on them. Absolutely. And Sean, I have uh, one question. This is Maria. And yes. how do you how how is it that you feel like it's best handled when you have a faculty member who might be hesitant? They they don't haven't used OER in the past. They're not very interested in maybe creating OER to share with the world. How do you help them become better acclimated to the idea of it? Well, uh, no, that's on my side. Well, first, they have to be formally introduced to OER and, and sit them down and tell them a story, like one of my stories, I have plenty, and get them excited about OER. And, and once they realize the value of OER, what impact they can make on students, and, and, and I know a lot of them are skeptical about uh, OER materials. They think they are of poor quality or whatever. That's our job to show them quality uh, uh, OER materials that are available for them and how they can contribute to, to, to the uh, uh, database uh, of, of OER materials. So it, it takes a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a faculty, if that's what it takes, then that's what we need to do to get that faculty member on board. Because sometimes they may not know what impact they can make. We need to uh, uh, inform them. Education, education, anybody, everybody needs to be educated on things that they are not uh, uh, familiar with. Thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions? Okay, well, Quinetta, I'm going to pass it back to you, and, and um, we thank you, um, Jean-Jacques, for being here and for, for taking time for us. You're just a wealth of knowledge. Speaking speaking from my own seat, I, I learn every time I, I listen to you speak. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Modestin, for sharing that with all of us. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Clarissa West-White who is the university archivist, assistant professor at Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida. She earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees in creative writing, curriculum and instruction, English education and information from the Florida State University. Dr. West White has experience as a middle and high school English teacher, program coordinator, adult literacy director, University English Department Chair, Reference Librarian Research instruction, Instructor and Assistant Professor, and adjunct at several public and private universities within the state of Florida and online. She has completed arch archival 
projects, given presentations and conducted research on Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and served as an education consultant with the U.S. and Florida Department of Education. She has received several fellowships and scholarships and serves as past president of Florida Association of College and Research Libraries. Dr. West has been working with the Hewlett OER since 2014, and she brings a wealth of knowledge that she's going to share. Before I give it to her, I fail to say that Dr. Modestin has been with OER since 2017. Right, Dr. West White, take it over. <laughs> Good afternoon, Howard. I'm hoping everyone is well and rested. Um, and that you were able to take really good notes from um, Dr. John Jacques. And um, hopefully this is helpful as well. So the first question was, where do you find small wins? And so I used um, a, couple, a photo to answer, uh, to visualize the answer uh, for you and for me. So one of the strategies that has worked best for me uh, and finding and really ensuring that small wins continue to manifest is connecting with faculty where they are physically as well as as well as pedagogically. Um, at a, our HBCU is very small, and so we likely bump into each other in the hall, um, in the library parking lot, the CAF, the PAC. There are just a few places on campus where we all congregate. And I am really um, probably a private detective in another life. And so one of the things I do when I'm around a large group of people, whether I know them or not, is I start to take mental notes um, of the work that faculty post on social media, that I see them do on campus, that I hear them having conversations about with other people, or a conversation they may strike with me so that I'm able to see them um, as faculty, but also as researchers, as content area experts. Um, and because this campus is small, many of our faculty also do work in the community. And so, again, if I see them there, you know, I walk up and I just say, hey, you know, I'm in the library, I'm the archivist, you know, however they know me. Um, I was English, when I first arrived at Cookman, I was an uh, English professor, and then I became chair, and then the library. And so somewhere in there, if I've met them before, I just kind of have to figure out when and where. Um, and then I started the conversation about their research, their interests, like what are they working on now? Um, especially if they're new to campus, like how their educational journey. Is this your first HBCU? Where have you been? Is this your first job? Um, have you published before? Uh, have you, are you looking into revamping your syllabus? So eventually the, the conversation, you know, I'm able to kind of guide the conversation. Um, and of course, it's not necessarily in that order or all at once that I kind of bombard them, but it's really important I find in making faculty connections because if I'm going to ask them to do something later or next, I need to have met them at least once or twice, try to remember their name, or if I can't remember their name because sometimes I'm just horrible, I still can remember their answers to their research question. I can still say, oh, are you still looking into coming up with new ways to engage your students in your um, biology or chemistry class because what you did last semester is not working. Like I, I may remember that um, and still not remember their name. And so I try to remember to take pencil paper notes. Um, I use my phone. I may do a quick um, memo just because sometimes at the end of the conversation you forget. So um, I then work my way. To, this usually does not happen the very first time, but the second or third time I, I'm able to do my library pitch and I'm able to talk to them about the resources that the library offers, um, not only academically, but professionally um, and personally as well. For example, our um, QEP is housed in our library 
a colleague and I volunteered to serve on the QEP committee. Not a lot of people were running to the committee. So of course she said, yes, um, this wasn't the fun committee. So when the two librarians said, hey, you need us? Uh, she said, yes. And it has been a very fruitful um, collaboration and committee work. Um, when we joined, we were able to um, glean the purpose of the QEP, um, our next, so we're in year two, so over the next five years, um, learn its purpose, the research, the faculty members who were on the committee were engaged in and how we could help. And of course, we have these things in the library called um, lib guides and some call them research guides, lib guides, but most people keep the word guide in their in the title. And we offer to put QEP in a lib guide um, because we know faculty may not read an email with 20 links to 20 articles about QEP. They may not attend the QEP meeting down the hall. Um, but if we can put all the information they need about QEP, um, who's in charge, the mission, what it's about, what it's going to address over the next five years, who are the key players, what are some research that you need to be familiar with, how can you include these new ideas and strategies in your course. And then also it gave us the opportunity to infuse OER in the LibGuide. And so it's just a link. So we just send them that link. And a LibGuide, um, if you've never seen them, they I have one that comes up later in the presentation, so I'll show you then. But a LibGuide can have countless numbers of tabs. Um, you can organize it as one web page that just scrolls forever, or you can have multiple pages. Um, you can embed any and everything. And so it's a great way to introduce faculty to information. And the QEP, again, this collaboration has worked uh, really well with um, between the library and QEP. And the fact that they're housed in the library also helps. We were able to also, and, and again, the QEP, the um, LibGuide that I'll show will demonstrate how it can be tailored to discipline specific materials, or even at the course level, we use LibGuides here for a lot of different things. But one of the what makes it really popular is that we're able to include OER pretty stream um, seamlessly. You just add a link, uh, name the link, the thing, and just tell people to go and click. Um, and then we can upload uh, tutorials, videos on how to. And then because again, the library is a place where you're gonna ha have find helpful people, you can click a link that says, ask the librarian or schedule an appointment with the librarian. And so we have found um, using OER and OER tools um, because this tool is offered free to our campus um, really helps them to see OER in different layers so that I'm not just, hitting them up with OER when I see them in the parking lot, I can follow up. And when I hear them having a conversation or remember that it was they were having a problem with maybe class attendance. Well, class attendance has a lot to do with engagement. If I don't feel connected to the instructor, if I don't feel like this is gonna make sense or it doesn't seem to have any real purpose in my life, then why am I coming to class? Um, and so once, teachers and faculty members can kind of set themselves aside because, you know, this is a personal, these are people. And so we have personal feelings. Um, but if we can get out of our own way and go, something's not right with my class and I need to figure it out. And if it's me, maybe I need to put myself to the side and then see how I can, how my students see me. Um, and so those are really tough conversations to have, but it helps that when the instructor is ready to have it, you're able to then say, oh, so you want to like wow and amaze at the same time they learn something, then you can go through a list of OER. And we are now um, ready to talk about AI being OER in the fall. Um, and I'll talk about that at the end. But that is just another avenue for teachers who may not um, 
be in their spring season of teaching and they feel like they're in their winter, but they're really in their fall. And so just trying to get them re-energized and reinvigorated to teaching, because again, you know, this is part performance. I mean, I don't know about many of you. I just know when I taught middle school, high school, at the end of the day, I was physically drained. It was the talking, it was the thinking, it was the discipline, it was the class management. And then it was remembering that, yeah, they got to pass a test. And so, you know, it was just exhausting. And so um, we just try to make sure that even looking at OR, we can couch it to different faculty members at different stages of their career to say, you know, you, you're young and you're ready to go. Let's let's go. But for those who may be waning, we can say, let's just try to see if there's one assignment that is your biggest assignment that we can play with and adjust as some OR, OER, including AI, um, and maybe get everyone back on the same page. Next slide. So how do you choose to celebrate um, those small steps? Next slide. Uh, there was a song that said something about give people what they want or something, give them what they really, really want. Or, um, but trying to give faculty what they need, even if they didn't know they need it. And so if they don't know they need it, they're not going to ask for it. Um, so once we connect, it is then a matter of us, you know, the librarians, myself, asking faculty <laughs> to assist. Um, it's a matter of time when units on campus will need to call on faculty for help, right? The library is no different. We have reports, we have stats, um, surveys. We have things that need to be completed. The university has likewise, deans likewise. Um, student activities, student affairs, you definitely want faculty to come. So at some point, everyone on campus is going to need something from faculty members. After inheriting the Hewlett um, Affordable Solutions Grant from Dr. McSwain, who was here, um, when I arrived in 2014, she was well on her way of converting all of our OER, um, all of our gen ed to OER. Um, it was apparent that since all of general ed courses were created using online shells embedded with OER after a mandate from university leadership at that time that all classes needed to be free or no more than $40. <laughs> so for the next iteration of the grant cycle, because she was able to get our gen ed, the o o online um, shells embedded with OER, that's 60 hours of our students, 120. Um, so I, I thought the next step would be graduate school. It's smaller and felt that we can get, if we can get as many uh, faculty as possible, we can reach pretty much all of the grad students. Um, so I did. And back to across our graduate programs um, offerings agree, I would say about 80% of our graduate faculty participated. Some added one or two assignments using online materials. Others reworked their syllabus to become cost-free. Word of mouth is the best advertisement. They were able to share their experiences with others. And as a former middle high school English teacher and college, English assistant professor, I find it useful to work alongside students on assignments. If I ask them to create a poem, I created a poem too. I have carried or at least tried to carry this philosophy or work ethic of shared and lifelong learning into all the roles I assume. So when graduate faculty members were editing their courses, I forced myself out of my comfort zone to create OER minutes. Um, there are video plugs that feature OER tools. Um, I did one every week from October to December. And um, you may not know it, but I'm pretty shy. And so this was a challenge for me. But how was it that I can ask them to step out their comfort zone and I not do something to show that I could do the same? Um, 
So it reminded me that starting something new can not only be overwhelming, but frightening. Did faculty ask for these OER minutes? No, they did not. But it has been helpful for me to share a quick video with a new faculty member or a faculty new to me and share a suggested OER without trying to match schedules for an office visit or delaying their work. Because you know, just like I know, when you're ready to work, you're ready to work, you're ready to start. And so you don't wanna have to call 50 people, find the book, um, remember the phone number or the person's name for the email. So the videos help in providing the information quickly and it includes um, instructions, click here, click there. Um, so they can move forward when they are ready to start work because we know getting started is often the hardest part. The next slide. Can I see where I'm going to finish. So at what point do small wins become the more impactful pieces? Next. And how do you know you are there? So this is an example of what our lib guides look like. Um, this is the OER um, QEP, I mean, OER, sorry, lib guide. Libraries are one of the best, best places on earth to witness teamwork. So one of our librarians challenged herself this year to improve her tech skills and create more engaging content. So she began by redesigning many of the lib guides we have. As you can see, I added AI, and I went to the summit. <laughs> um, those who traveled with me to the AI summit last month will build out the AI content to include activities that are general. Um, one of the presenters shared a general assignment that can be adapted really quickly across disciplines, fields, courses. Um, so we're going to definitely add that and show them how to tweak it and to create activities and assignments that are specific to their disciplines. They will also include AI tools and resources and personal feedback on how the tool works. Oftentimes, what's sometimes frustrating as faculty will click on something because someone said, hey, I tried this, it worked, this is what I do in my course. And then when we get into it, we may be lost. Like, how do you get started? Do you log in? I, am I supposed to pay? I, you thought you said it was free. And then when you go back to the faculty member, they, they're like, oh, I forgot to tell you, like, oh, this is a pain. This is the problem. So to prevent that, we uh, will include some feedback on um, pros and cons so that people kind of know what they're getting to before they click the link to get started. Creating the QEP libguide that I mentioned previously was a small win that has become quite impactful. Working with the QEP director, she was able to help us get faculty to complete their profile that appears in one of our libguides. So as you can see in this libguide across uh, from in the left, yeah, your, my left column, um, you can add as many links, um, pages. It could go across the top. You can embed, embed videos. Um, so we use this also for our faculty libguides that includes a headshot, includes their um, CV links to their social media, um, their academic career uh, pathway. Um, and working with her, because this is just kind of how something really small, like we volunteered to be on a committee. We worked with creating a libguide. Um, then she was able to kind of assist us. Um, she paid for the photographer to do the faculty headshots. And she encouraged them through QEP to complete their profile. We've used this for um, SAC COC um, reaffirmation visits because it's a way to put all the faculty, current faculty members information in one place. We can lock it, we can put a, a password on it and protect it. Um, and so we're also able to add, to link web, um, lib guides to other lib guides. So like this OER lib guide is linked to our QEP web um, lib guide so that faculty who may not have been here um, as you know since 2014 or may have just arrived a couple of months ago and now need to work on their fall syllabus for their courses will know about QEP. Um, they can then find out about OER from there. And again, there's a 
all kind of links that say, hey, reach out to me for more information or for independent meetings. Um, next slide. What do you find to be the most successful ways to build buy-in? <laughs> and the last, um, next slide is the last slide. So what I learned from Dr. McSwain when she was here uh, is that money talks. It always does. Um, faculty are no different from any other consumer in, in America. Um, inflation hits, it hits them too. Uh, and so offering any type of financial compensation, stipends, trips um, are really really go, uh, they really do go a long way because then word of mouth, they sh they post their photos on social media. Their faculty friends are like, where did you go? How did you get to go there? And then it, it creates its own um, energy. And so when connecting to faculty members, observation is important. So recently I was able to take four faculty members and supported two others in seeking funds from their dean to attend the AI Summit at TSU a few weeks ago. I made sure I got them per diem, um, hotel, airfare, reimbursed re -imburse them for um, parking, uh, uh, Ubers, whatever. Um, so this was at no cost to them other than what they purchased on their own. Uh, for example, um, Dr. Caputo is a professor in Mass Comms. He loves technology and all AI things. Uh, he uses a variety of AI tools in his courses. My son took his course and learned multiple uses of open free AI tools that he has in his toolkit and is prepared to now take them with him to graduate school. The summit also provided Dr. Caputo the opportunity to present his work. So he um, had not heard of the summit, but when I asked him to attend, he saw the call and then submitted a proposal. Uh, that was accepted, so he presented while he was there. The library shares a letter uh, from Dr. Bethune's uh, collection every Monday during the academic year, and he reached out to the library to voice to to provide voice to those letters. So we are still working on housing and storing them so that we can then share them with the public. Um, three of the attendees are from English, spanning two to twelve years of academic service to the institution. Uh, Mr. Peacock, Ms. Mercer, and Mrs. Grumman. Uh, one is a technology guru, guru and is seeking her PhD in the field. One teaches primarily freshman comp and the other higher English level courses. They have varying interests within the English discipline, but they all see uses for AI. And since they teach general education courses, whatever they do will have a far reach in getting AI tools in the hands of our students. Likewise, Dr. White, who teaches education in African-American history, also teaches a general education course and is look, looking to reinvigorate his education course um, and reimagine his syllabus. Finally, Dr. Butts teaches anatomy and biology courses. She was so excited to see the AI tools used specifically for science. Um, that was, So the demonstrations at the summit really blew her over and she came back really energized and enthused um, about this upcoming fall. Emerging technologies can cause angst and anxiety, but also passion and the opportunity for faculty who are near burnout to re-energize and fall back in love with teaching. At a limited in, uh, resource institution, such as the one um, we have here, uh, most faculty, including myself, wear many hats. And so it's really important to build a team and OER and AI, those tools are not just for faculty to use in their courses, but they're also available for individuals to use to make their lives better, to make group work work, to make teamwork possible. And so we're able to try a lot of those things out in the library and that has been helpful and fruitful and highly productive because then we're able to share that with faculty. Um, this is something you can use to help your students um, in your courses collaborate, but you could also use it within your own department um, so that we're not still in these silos with these deafening um, 
thick walls that, you know, we're, <laughs> we keep saying we're trying to break out of, but sometimes you don't see it. Um, and we're finding that AI and OER, same side of the coin, um, are helping to kind of get us started in the right direction. And I think that's my time. Okay. Cornetta, do you have uh, anything else you'd like to share? And thank you so much, Dr. Westwhite. Such a, a plethora of advice and smart kinds of approaches toward onboarding and sustaining the initiative on campus. And Cornetta, I'm going to ask you if you have anything else you'd like to share. Thank you, Dr. Westwhite, for all of the information. And I just wanted to share with everyone our next uh, summer session will be July the 9th. No, it's today, July the 23rd. And I hope that you guys come out and get another wealth of information on OER. We enjoyed having you here. And I hope that you all gain something from today's session. If you have any questions, I've, I've been in contact with many of you. You can uh, feel free to email either me or Maria or is... Uh, but Rick still on here and Rick. Yeah, Rick is here. And yep. we had a we had a question earlier too that said um, the registration page was a little bit confusing, and um, it did not provide a a link and an invitation directly into your calendar. So I sent a separate invitation with the Zoom link to your calendars for that reason. We'll fix that for the next round of um, workshop sessions that we provide in the fall. So, so not to worry. And thank you to those who um, shared that with us. And Audie says, thanks to all the presenters. Job well done. Yeah, beautiful work. And it's so smart uh, to for us to be able to, to follow in the footsteps of those who have learned these lessons. And it's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's taken them a lot of time to get here. And so we appreciate your sharing your expertise. Um, Dr. Melton, do you have, would you like to close? Are you still in the room? Dr. Melton has gone to another meeting. She did, okay. All right, so we are gonna close up. This uh, recording will be available on the HBCU Resource Center. Um, on the workshop page, uh, along with the slide deck. The slide deck is already there. You can go and download it if you like. And um, you have my email from uh, all of this communication around these workshops. Please feel free to reach out to me. Happy to help connect you to the people that you need to, to chat with, as well as um, Quinetta Bartley at TSU and Rick Lundu. Um, thank you again, everybody, for being here. I do, and I do, I do have a question. 